So we'll go ahead and start. Um, so this is Vlad Grigrescu again, who came up several times yesterday, and he's going to talk about how to write a protocol analyzer in Bro. So I'm Vlad again from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and uh, so I think last time I counted, Bro supported something like 37, 38 protocols. And um, you know we, that, that number is ever growing and trying to drum up more interest for people that have extra protocols on the network that they really want to start analyzing. And my interest in this really started when at Carnegie Mellon we started deploying Bro further and further uh, into our network. So like most people we deployed at the border initially and started seeing all the traffic. Um, and then we started being able to see things like DHCP traffic and went, well, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we could have a table in memory in Bro that would map IP to Mac mappings, and then we could do some device-based tracking, and on wireless networks, we wouldn't you know, have people jumping IPs every 10 minutes or whatever. Um, and uh, so there's a DHCP analyzer that was recently added to Bro that will, uh, that will log all that for you. Um, another example of something that I want to do is a, a radius analyzer so that we can actually take it the next step and start doing user-based tracking since radius gives us enough information in clear text that you can see the MAC address and the username and whether the authentication succeeded or failed. Um, so I mean these are all protocols that if you're running at your border you probably don't want to see. A lot of you hopefully have those firewalled off. Um, but, uh, but as you start running it internally, it really kind of opens some interesting possibilities uh, of, of these extra protocols that now have a lot of meaning and can kind of add context to some of the, some of the built-in um, scripts. So in terms of the things that the analyzers need to do, um, so you need to parse the network traffic. And really, this is just taking the data off the wire and converting it into some kind of structure that you can work with where you can access all the elements that you care about. And then you need to figure out which events you need to generate, uh, since most of Bro is about handling events, and figure out how you want to go ahead and handle those events. And more than likely, you probably want to create some logs for whatever this protocol is. And these kind of happen at two different uh, layers in, in, the, in Bro. Um, so actually parsing the network traffic and generating the events happens at the so-called core layer um, in C++. And, uh, and then handling the events happens at, in the script layer, uh, as does the actual log generation. So to kind of dive into this, the first thing we want to do is parse the traffic. And Bro gives us the, the payload of the packet that we care about, and then we need to figure out you know, what, what's in this packet and how we can actually work with it in a fairly programmer, user-friendly way. Um, so my example here is just the start of a syslog packet. And syslog is one of the most simple protocols out there. Um, and uh, really all it has is two components. One is the priority of the message, and one is the message itself. And the priority is just this one to three digit number enclosed between angle brackets. Uh, and then whatever the rest of the packet is, that's what your message will end up being. And obviously, it's over UDP and has a variable length packet size. Uh, and the priority actually encodes two numbers that we care about. One of them is the facility. So those are things like kernel and mail and auth and, and all the stuff that you see under var log, usually. Uh, and the other thing is the severity of the message, if it's debug, critical, warning. and there are actually seven severities that you can have. Uh, so with a bit of math, you can encode both the facility and the severity into one number. Um, so to actually work with this, you want to have it in some kind of structure. If you're doing it in C, this is probably what you'd end up with, where you have an integer for the facility, an integer for the severity, and a, some variable length string for the message itself. And kind of the naive approach to this is to just write some parsing code to figure out where the angle brackets are and where it ends. And then you uh, try to convert whatever is between the angle brackets to a number and convert that to facility and severity. And then you take the offset you just had and kind of everything from there to the end of the packet becomes the message. And you know th this is really fairly straightforward to do for syslog, but this really doesn't scale well to more complicated protocols. And you know, 
know, you end up with a lot of like hard-coded delimiters and offsets, and it also makes your code pretty hard to read. Uh, to un it's really not understandable, um, and it's hard to really check it for correctness and for consistency. Um, and the other kind of caveat to all this is that it turns out that many protocols really reuse a lot of the same constructs. Uh, so if they have, you know, C style null terminated strings or Pascal strings or uh, a lot of protocols use a type length value construct, but they basically have these small building blocks that get repeated between the protocols, sometimes with slight differences between them. And these are hard to abstract away well. So you end up kind of repeating very similar code with slight tweaks between all your different analyzers. Um, so to address some of these issues, there was some work done on a language called BinPack. Uh, and this is a domain-specific language designed just for protocol parsing. Um, and essentially, it, it takes these building blocks of uh, formats that repeat between the different protocols and you, you, you build them as types um, of data structures. And you can then combine these types into records and build larger types and kind of keep building up uh, on those, uh, those primitives. Um, and it's really designed to recognize some of these constructs that keep repeating in languages and give you a way to easily deal with them, uh, figure out what the options are that might differ between different protocols and, and let you customize how you want to handle them. The way this works in practice is that you end up writing these .pack files, and when you go to run make and bro, those .pack files will get converted into C++ code, and then that code just gets compiled along with uh, the rest of bro whenever you go to compiled bro. So really, if you have the .pack files in place, then you just run make and the analyzer just sh shows up in bro. And a lot of this became much simpler recently with a bit of um, reworking of the file structure in bro where now every an analyzer gets on its own subdirectory and you can clearly see which files are associated with that analyzer and you don't have to mess with files that just combine all the analyzers together. Um, so to actually see what our syslog example would look like with binpack, um, so we can define a syslog message type. Uh, and this is just a record which combines one or more uh, other types. And we have this PRI element, which is of type syslog priority, which we'll define in a second. And then after the priority, we have the message. And this is just a byte string. And we tell binpack that wherever the previous element finished, uh, just take everything else in the packet and shove it into this element. So we have this rest of data uh, option. Um, and then the last thing we need to know is what, what is the byte order for this, uh, for this traffic. And it's just little endian, so we have this byte order option at the bottom and tell it what, uh, exactly what, uh, what to expect. So the syslog priority type itself, uh, so again, we have these two angle brackets. And then we have a one to three digit number between the angle brackets. So we define another type for the syslog priority. It too is a record, just combining other uh, types. And we have this less than and greater than elements, which are just designed to store the angle brackets. And we know that those are just going to be one character. So we, we just have an 8-bit integer that, that those will go into. And then to grab whatever is between them, we can actually use regular expressions. Um, so here we just have a regular expression for one or more digits. Um, and it'll just, whatever matches that regular expression, with the regular expression being greedy, of course, uh, it'll take that and shove it into this temp PRI element. Um, now, this isn't entirely correct. You probably want to actually check that the, ang the less than is a less than symbol and the greater than is a greater than symbol. and the regular expression should be refined to be between one and three digits. Um, but for most cases, this will actually, if, if you're actually seeing syslog traffic, this will extract the, the syslog traffic out. So we have this tempri element, and it's a string because it, we pulled out with the regular expression. But to really work with it, we want it to be an integer. And so we need to do a bit of post-processing uh, on, on this data. 
And to do post-processing, we have this let construct where it goes through and parses everything at the top, and then it will just do the post-processing in this let block. Um, so here, all we do is we take our temp PRI string, and we convert it to a base 10 integer with this byte string to int function, and we define a new element, pry, which will just store that and pry as an integer. Um, so we pulled it as a regular expression, now we just convert it to an int, and now we can actually do some math with it. And we want to do some math to pull out the actual facility and the severity. And again, uh, it's just pretty easy to do some integer division and some modular math to pull those out, though you don't want to actually do that in production, but just for the sake of clarity, this is th this will get you the, the numbers back out. Um, so we've gone through, we defined our syslog message type, uh, and then in the syslog priority type, we end up with the facility and the severity that we care about, and we have the message in the syslog message itself. So what we've done so far will constitute a syslog-protocol.pack file. And you'll see that most of the existing analyzers have these dash protocol.pack files. And as the name implies, that just really defines the protocol. It defines the types and uh, works to just pull out the relevant data and make it accessible to you. And usually you need to do some extra analysis on it, um, which, uh, which will come down the line. But So are there any questions with, with what, what I've talked about so far? I, I know this is kind of, uh, it has many syntax quirks and probably not what people are used to looking at, but. So the next thing we want to do is we actually want to go ahead and generate an event for the script la layer to handle. Um, so whenever we see a syslog message, let's generate the syslog message event. And there are a few things that we actually want, that we care about and want the script layer to be able to see and work with and log or do whatever else. Uh, and the first thing is the connection because you know we want to see the source, the desk, the ports that they're using and all the other stuff that you're used to seeing from your broad logs. Um, then the facility and the severity and the actual message itself. Um, and with all bro scripting, these need actual data types associated with them. So we have a connection, a couple of integers for the facility and severity, and the message is just a string. Uh, and we need to do a bit of syntax tweaking to get this into the right format where we define this as an event and then we have to include <coughs> the arguments between these percent signs. Um, but uh, th this ends up being the event that we want, and this gets saved in this events.bif file. And the events.bif file just lists all the events that Bro should know about that your analyzer might end up generating. Um. So I actually generate the events. Uh, so this is what our protocol file looks like so far. Again, with the syslog message type, the syslog priority type, and I've I don't know if you can read that, but I bolded message, facility, and severity, uh, since those are really the three elements that we care about, that we want to get back out of this. So we can define a function to go ahead and process a syslog message, and all it will do is uh, process it and end up generating the event for us. And again, the th we have the three things that we care about in there. Uh, and uh, this function needs to return a boolean, and we enclose the actual function contents in this, again, quirky syntax with percent curly brace. So to generate events, we use this bif event uh, generate functions. Uh, so the name of our event is syslog message, and we use the, and we prefix it with this generate underscore syntax uh, out of bif event. And so our event takes the connection uh, the facility, the severity, and the uh, message itself. And the message, we want it to be uh, a string that the, the script layer can work with, so we need to do a bit of converting with this byte string to val function. And it does take one extra argument, this bro analyzer argument, and that's just the instance of the bro analyzer that, 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 was, that generated this event. Um, this won't make it into your event that you handle at the script layer, but this is useful um, and, and kind of gets handled behind the scenes for you. But you just need to pass it this, uh, this argument for, for all the uh, events that you end up generating. 
And finally, that this is a Boolean function, so we have it return true uh, at the end. Um, so we would call this function, we would pass it the facility severity in the message, and we'll get into exactly how we pass that data in and how this function gets called. And all it does is it generates this event for us, and then the, that goes into the script layer where we, we'd be able to handle it and we have all the information we need. So there, there are two concepts uh, that, that are useful in, in BINPACK, and this is the connections and flows. Uh, and I'm sure most people are, are familiar with those terms, but uh, it, it's a... Um, so here we actually have a client going out to a server, and we have a request, and then we have a matching response. And the way this is treated in BINPACK is that we have an upflow from the client to the server, and then a downflow as the response. Uh, and some networking uh, terminology likes to classify one flow as both ends of that connection. Here it's really just a unique set of source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, and, and protocol. So we have one unique flow going up to the server, and then one unique flow coming down from the server. And those two flows together end up making a connection. Um, so what will happen is you have a connection in BINPACK, and that consists of one upflow and one downflow, and then you can handle that however you want. Um, and BINPACK also, or actually I'll, I'll get that back to that in a second. But uh, So here we'll end up with a, uh, a syslog connection that actually consists of two syslog flows, one going up to the server and one going back down to the client. In practice, for syslog, you don't really have the connection going back down to the client. You just have someone sending uh, the fire hose of syslog traffic over to your syslog collector. Um, but we can take both the, both the connection and the flows, and we can extend it. We can add functions to it, and we can add variables, and, um, and we can use that for things like keeping track of state. Uh, Syslog doesn't care about that, but any other, most other protocols actually need to keep track of state, knowing if you, you know, if you send a request to the server and you actually got a reply back, or if the server is just sending you replies for no reason, uh, and, and even more complex protocols have a, have a complicated state diagram that you need to follow and figure out if this is actually obeying the protocol or not. So here, we're, what we're going to do is extend the syslog flow to include this function that we just defined. Uh, and, and we extend things in BINPACK with this refine keyword. Um, so all we're doing is uh, having this refine flow, uh, syslog flow, and then we plus equals this function that we just defined. And this makes the function accessible through our flow. So to actually call this, we, we can use this context.flow and then the, the name of the function that we just defined. Um, so I in the context of the flow that we're dealing with, we're going to go ahead and call this function, and we're going to pass it the three things we care about. So we have this pri.facility, severity, and message. Um, and the reason that these are pri. Dot is because in our syslog message type that we're extending here, all it knows about is pri and message, and then these are sub-elements of this pri element. Um, and again, here we're extending the syslog message type, and all we're doing is adding some extra post-processing to it uh, with this let keyword again. And in the post-processing, we declare this variable of proc syslog message that we don't actually care about, and we're setting that equal to the result of this function that we just defined. So what this will do is whenever syslog message is done parsing a syslog message, it starts doing the post-processing, and uh, it, it'll pass, uh, it'll call this function and pass the data that we want, and in the function, the event gets generated. So where we're at now is we refined our flow, we added this function that generates the event, and then we refined our syslog message type, and whenever it's done processing syslog message, it just calls that function. And this goes into the syslog analyzer.pack file. Uh, and this is the, the file that really generates the events. And uh, for more complicated protocols, we'll also end up handling state. And 
All right, so any questions so far? I, I know this is kind of a, a lot to ingest, and, and uh, but, okay. So at, at this point, we're, we're pretty much done with the things that we need to do at the core layer, where we've parsed the traffic out, we can now have it in a format we can work with, and we take that data and we start generating the events with it. Um, so the next thing to do is start handling those events. So this is what the bro script might look like for this. Uh, we define a new syslog module, and we tell it um, which ports we care about. Uh, so kind of the, the naive way of doing this is to just tell it bro to look for traffic on specific ports, and then whenever it sees that traffic, it'll associate your analyzer with that traffic. Um, so syslog is over 514 UDP, so we define a ports variable with that. And then we also have this variable of likely server ports, which helps Bro figure out who is the originator and who's the responder. Um, again, doesn't really matter so much for syslog, but for more complicated protocols, th this might be useful. Um, and then whenever Bro initializes, it calls this Bro init event, and we can handle that to add some extra code to the initialization of Bro. And what we're doing is calling this register for ports function, which tells Bro that. Uh, whenever it sees traffic on the ports on 514 UDP, go ahead and also use this analyzer in addition to any other analyzers that might be used. So this will go ahead and register our analyzer, and hopefully whenever we start seeing syslog traffic, our event will start firing. And so we have our syslog message event with the connection, the facility, the severity, and the message. And we would go in and handle that however we want to. Uh, for something like syslog, you'd probably start doing some logging uh, and actually end up with the syslog.log file where you see all the syslog messages come in. Um, here I'm just printing out the, the message uh, after the, the excitement that I have a message and that this is actually working. Um, and then, of course, other scripts can also handle this event, and you can start doing things like having scripts that nor start to try to normalize your syslog or maybe look for a specific string in your syslog and then have Bro uh, act on that, or uh, maybe use that information in conjunction with other, uh, with uh, things like the SSH uh, detections of, you know, Bro saw a suspicious SSH connection, and then you were able to confirm from syslog that, you know, that was an actual connection, they logged in as this user, and, and maybe you want to act on that. So at this point, our, our, our script just ends up looking like this. Uh, we define our ports, we associate our analyzer with those ports, and then whenever we see a syslog message, uh, we get this syslog message event, and, and we can then handle it. And this goes into the, the script's main.bro file generally, uh, which just uh, registers it, handles the events, and hopefully gets you some logs coming in. So this works great, but of course one of Bro's features is that it doesn't work for just traffic on running on standard ports, but actually does a pretty good job of detecting traffic running on non-standard ports. <coughs> um, so the way we deal with that it is through the dynamic protocol detection framework. And we, write, we end up writing signatures for what we know certain traffic looks like. Uh, and we tell it that if whenever you see this, uh, whenever something matches this signature, go ahead and associate this analyzer with that traffic. Um, so here we're writing a, a, a signature for dynamic protocol detection for syslog. Uh, and right now we're only worried about UDP syslog, and that's the only thing we can parse. Uh, and we tell it that the protocol needs to be UDP. And we have this regular expression that we're looking for, which is just the angle brackets and then one to three digits following it, and the, the close angle bracket. And whenever it'll see that pattern, it'll go ahead and it'll enable the syslog analyzer for it. Yes? How does that syslog string get like associated with the analyzer that you just built? How does that tie together? Um, so there, there's a... a so I guess I should back up a bit. So there are, there are some other files that I'm skipping over that you need to create. 
And the reason I'm skipping over them is because they're pretty much standard for all analyzers, and the only thing that changes is the name of the analyzer. Uh, and I'm actually working on a set of scripts where you give it the name of the analyzer and kind of a description of it and a couple of options, and it'll just go create all the files you need. And then the only files you need to modify are the ones I've kind of been touching on. But so there is a, a file um, that has some information on the analyzer, which is a plugin essentially. Uh, and it has the name of the analyzer and, and a description of the analyzer. And so Bro knows that, you know, that this is that this analyzer is named syslog and it knows which analyzer to actually associate with it. Um, and I think I'll touch on that script in, in a couple slides here. But, but yeah, so unfortunately there, there are a f quite a few files that need to be created, uh, but most of them are just boilerplate, and I think there's only five files that you actually need to go in and, and really make modifications to to get your analyzer working. So we have our signature, and this goes into the dpd.sig file, and that's also in, in script land. Um, <coughs> And, uh, and and if you look at some of the other dpd.sigs, you can see that there's a special one for clients and servers and some, you know, and they have more complex criteria. But the other very useful thing is how to deal with errors that come up. Um, since us usually as you go through and you start working on a protocol analyzer, it's very much an iterative process where maybe you can only parse out the, the topmost packet uh, and don't care about any of the data under it, but you're just excited that you were able to identify it as whatever and, and, and that the event fired. Um, and then as you kind of keep going through, you delve deeper and deeper into the packet and you build more and more types and, uh, and just kind of keep iterating it. So there's this very handy protocol violation event uh, which tells you the connection, the analyzer that was associated with it, and, uh, and the reason that the that the that there was a violation in the protocol. Um, so, for example, here there's an exception that there was a string mismatch, and it tells you which file it was the sip dash protocol pack file. It tells you the line number on there, and you can see that it was expecting this regular expression, and it actually got nothing. So, what happened here is that the packet truncated, or the, the packet finished and the analyzer was unable to handle the condition of maybe there's a flag that tells you to not expect any more data, or there, there's something missing in, in, the, in the analyzer here. And you, you, get, you actually get to see you know, expected and actual data and try to keep refining your, your analyzer to handle more and more cases and hopefully cut down on the exceptions that you're actually seeing. So I mentioned the, the bootstrapping script a bit, and I was really hoping to get this out for the presentation, but I do want to test it a bit more. Um, but I'll end up posting this on GitHub and sending an email to the bro mailing list, which, oh, by the way, I recommend everyone to sign up for. Um, but basically the way this works is that you have the start.py script, you tell it the name of your analyzer, a short description of what it does, and you point it to your bro source code. And it will go, and it'll go and create all the files that you need to have created. And again, most of those are boilerplate for you. And it tells you these five files that you actually need to go and make modifications to. Uh, and these are the files that we just covered in, in this presentation. Um, so you have your dash protocol. Uh, and, and, and these top three are in the source directory. So these are in, in C++, or well, so in bin pack. Um, which gets converted to C++. Uh, you have your events.bif file defining your events, your analyzer where you're generating your events, and then your main.bro. And not all protocols can actually do the dynamic protocol detection. Some craptacular protocols just don't even give you a signature that you can use, and it's all just raw data. Um, but you know, it's always really useful if you, uh, if you can end up uh, being able to dynamically detect the, the traffic on non-standard ports as well. All right, so, so any questions at, at this point? <laughs> yeah. Um, so generally what it is is, uh, so the, the question was what does what the default skeleton content of those files look like? Uh, and that's something, uh, so 
I, I touched on some of the main syntax that you'll end up with, but binpack has a lot of extra constructs. So it has a case statement and um, uh, some other primitives. Um, so what, what I'm trying to do is create those files with comments, kind of giving you a quick reminder of here's the syntax and here's some examples of uh, you know the, how to build a type of with the record and having these elements in it and one's an integer and one's a regular expression, one's a byte string. Uh, and then here's a, how you might do post-processing on it, and little ND and big ND. And so it, it'll end up with some comments that, uh, that, that are in there as a reminder for some of this, so you don't have to kind of go back to the reference materials often. And, and there's, a, there's an option to disable the, those comments if you don't need that. Um, so I'm trying to yeah, just insert some sample code in there that's commented out. Um, things like the... Uh, Analyzer file uh, will have the connection defined as a as an upflow and a downflow, and then it'll let and it'll have a block for refine flow and refine or refine connection. And if you leave those blank, then it's not a problem. But any, any other questions? All right. Well, so I got one more. Sorry. <laughs> If they're not going to ask questions, then I'm going to I'm going to get into the extra credit slide. But so so I mentioned being able to actually save state, um, and I wanted to give an example of what that would actually look like, uh, since I feel like that that's something that you generally end up having to do um, for most analyzers. And essentially, when you have your flow or your connection, uh, you, you can define these member variables, uh, and, and the member variables will. Uh, are within the context of that flow, so any traffic associated with that flow, any packets can access those variables, can change those variables. But you know the the same protocol uh, on a on a different flow will have its own set. Uh, and then you initialize it, um, and and then your functions that you write. And I don't think my syntax is quite right. But and then your your functions that you write uh, actually have the ability to just go ahead and change those or read those or, or whatever else. Uh, so you know, when, when talking about storing state and modifying state, it's really if you're used to classes, it, it's the the same idea, um, where you have a constructor, uh, and then you can access them and modify them, and and so on. All right, so th so that's all I have. Thank you. But <laughs>